Welcome, friends, to the Someone Gets Me podcast. I am your host, Diane Allen, and I am so delighted that you're here. This podcast was created because I believe there is a visionary leader inside each one of us who is waiting to be seen. In each episode of Someone Gets Me, you will hear useful tips from successful visionaries who will share their stories about how being seen has allowed them to take their vision out into the world with action. The Power of Yes with entertainer Tony Russell. I am Diane Allen here with an amazing interview for you today. Tony Russell has been a longtime entertainer from Newark, New Jersey. He moved to California in the late 1960s. He's been in films like Bugsby and Casino and many more. He's been on TV in many shows, including The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. I know you've seen him there. He's also been in live theater and won awards. He's a very talented entertainer as a comedian, as an actor, and most importantly, he is an amazing, humble, gentle-spirited man. His story about his wife and his marriage moved me deeply. So enjoy this interview with Tony where we get to learn about the power of saying yes. Welcome everybody to Someone Gets Me. This is Diane, your host here, and I have a great interview for you today. Tony Russell, who is an amazing actor, comedian, he's hysterical actually, and he's a very talented person in both film, television, theater, and just all kinds of amazing experiences in his life. And he is so generously offered to be with us on the show today and talk in a really cool way about his life and his journey and what he sees moving forward. So, Tony, welcome to the show. Thank you, Diane. I'm excited to be here, really. I've never done a podcast, but this is like going to be a new experience for me, you know? (laughs) <laughs> That's great. I'm glad we can add it to your bio now that you've been on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, we can do oh. that. Right. So what I'd like to start with, because um, so that listeners can understand a little bit about who you are and where you came from, give us a little snapshot of of your younger years and, and how all of this started. How did you get in this this great creative entertainment space? Gee, when I was born, I came out singing. I mean, uh, they, they already, you no, know, but I was, well, music was like, it it came out so early. My whole family was musical, Diane. My, you know, my mother and father both played the piano and sang. My father used to sing at all the, uh, all the wedding. My father had a tremendous basso profundo voice, you know, and he sang Old Man River. And he would sing at all the wedding and any, any function, and he was called Tony too. I was named after my father. And everybody, when you go to a wedding, say, "Get Tony up there, get Tony." And Tony was old man River. He was tremendous. He brought the house wow. down every time, you know. So and uh, wow. like I say, well, they both played the piano, and my brother and I. Well, first of all, let me go back a minute. When when I was really young. Oh, I got to tell you this story. I just thought of this. I forgot this. Here's where we're, we're really in the care. I was in, I, here's a little story. We were in uh, kindergarten. What was I five years old or something? We're sitting, and it was Christmas time, and we were singing Christmas tongues carols. Right. So we're singing, and uh, and I must have been singing pretty good because the teacher, I remember this very clearly. She stopped everybody. She stopped singing, boys and girls. Stop singing. And then she went to Anthony, please come up here. So I got up and I walked up to her. And Diane, she lifted me. She took me from my underarms. She lifted mm-hmm. me under my arm arms and she lifted me all the way up and she stood me on her desk. And she Whoa. said, Sing. Well, I went right into it. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle. I sang the whole song. <laughs> so I was, I was a big hit in kindergarten, you know. But that, that was the beginning. That was, uh, you, you know, you know, there was a, like an indication maybe the, to, to you have something, you know. So uh, right. 
And also, and also with my family, my all everybody sang. I have my mom and dad, my older brother Bernie, my sister Carol, my sister Joyce, and we all sang and harmonized. After dinner, when I was growing up, it was a great time, Diane, because after dinner we would all sit around the table and sing old songs and harmonize, especially old songs that my mom and dad grew up with. And from the 1918s and 14, you know, the most songs like, in fact, my mother's favorite song was, uh, uh, we used to let her sing it alone. And my mother, my father would cry. <laughs> it was, wow. it was called, uh, it was, it was called, uh, till we meet again. And it went oh, like, yes. Ma, you know that song, Diane? Yes. Yes, Smile the while you kiss me sad do When the clouds roll by, I'll come to you. Like that. It goes on and on. It's a beautiful song. And we used to harmonize all the songs like that. Like that. So then my brother and I, my brother played a harmonica, by the way. He was a tremendous harmonica player. I mean, he could play the harmonica. And one day, I must have been like six or seven, I don't know, something like that. My father comes home with this thing called a banjo ukulele. And now it look, it's a ukulele, but it's it's round like a banjo, you know? In fact, uh -huh. I got it. I'm yeah. looking at it right here. I, I still got it. It's in my living room right here. And... Uh, and it came with the booklet to teach you how to play the chords and the fingerings. And I learned it in one day. I learned it in one day. And I was, I was right into it. So my brother and I started playing things together. And, you know, and, and uh, my father put us in a minstrel show at the local church. And we were a big hit there. And then one day we go down... We're from Newark, New Jersey, by the way. Grew up in Newark, New Jersey, in the projects called Stephen Crane Village. And so one day, my brother Bernie and I, we get on a trolley car. We were little kids. At that time, nobody knows where you were. and Nobody cared where you went. You just went, you know, uh, just as long as you're home by for dinner. So we get on a trolley car, and we go downtown Newark. New Jersey. Right. Right on Broad and Market Street, right in the middle of Newark, they had this booth there where you can pay ten cents and you make a record. Well, we we got the ten cents, five cents a piece. We put it in there and we made this record. <laughs> Great. And, and 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 I still have it today. And we, we sang we sang and harmonized Hey, good looking, what you got cooking? Remember that one? Oh, yes. I hey, that good one. looking, what you got cooking? How's about cooking something up with me? And then it goes on yeah. and on. But, uh, and we were and we were so proud. We thought we had a hit record, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that there, and uh, what else? And then, oh, I... I Musically, I'll tell you, okay, then I can tell you a story about, uh, I'm in grammar school, okay? Uh-huh. And, and I used to carry my ukulele around with me everywhere. And I remember, I must have been in the fifth grade, Diane, and I remember my teacher, Mr. Leckie. Mr. Leckie, he really took a liking to me. He used to tell you, Anthony, come here, play for the team, play for the class, sing a song. So I go take my ukulele and up there, and I used to do Al Jolson. I used to do all kinds of songs, and uh, and this went on for a few months. And he would, and I, he would let me sing for the class. So one day he called me up to his desk. He said, Anthony, come here, I want to talk to you. And they didn't start calling me Tony until years later, by the way. Okay. Uh, so. He said, Anthony, come here, I want to tell you something. He says, he looked at me, and I remember this very clearly. He says, you know, you're very talented and very cute, 
And here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down and see the music teacher, Mr. Schneider, and tell him that I want, I, I would like him to give you a real musical instrument so you can play at the band. And, 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 and tell him what I said. So I went down, I saw Mr. Snyder. I said, hi, Mr. Snyder, I'm Anthony Resinello, and Mr. Lecky told me to come down here to see you, if you could give me a, an instrument so I could play in the band. And Mr. Lecky told me to tell you I'm very talented and very cute. I did that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. What did the t music teacher yeah. do? Well, he went into the closet. It was in an auditorium, you know, where they had the band. And he pulled off a trombone off the off the top of the shelf, and the case was all falling apart, and, you know, and it was all scashad, as we say in Italian, it means all broken up, scashad. So, and he took it out and he showed me how to put it together. And he says, "Take this home and mess with it." So, Diane, listen to this. I take it home. I take it out of the uh, out of the box, okay, mm -hmm. and. I put it together, and I went, Mom! I said, Mom, look what Mr. Snyder gave me. And I went, rrr, rrr, rrr. and my mother started to laugh like you wouldn't believe. She was laughing so hard, I thought she was going to have a heart attack. I'm going, rrr, rrr, rrr. see, my mother had that kind of nature. She was, she was like, uh, she had that joie de vie, you know. She, she was always laughing and singing and dancing and all that stuff. And I was making this noise like, it sounded like a, like a herd of wounded cows or something. You know, but my mother had this kind of nature and uh, she was wonderful. She used to take us everywhere, my mother, you know, took to a circus. Uh, I, I remember, I remember my mother, was she, oh, well, one thing I, I gotta tell you, she used to wake me up early in the morning, and she would say, Anthony. My mother was like a little girl. She had that, that thing. She, she said, Anthony, she said, don't go to school today. Don't tell your father. We're coming to me. We're going to Coney Island. Because she wanted to go on the, on the rides with me. She wanted to go on the, on the uh, what's the name of that roller coaster in Coney Island? That, the, the Cyclone. Yep. She used yep. to take me on the Cyclone, and she used to scream and laugh. Anyway, and she I remember one time she took me to New York, and uh, I was about six years old, never been to New York. Wow. Wow. <laughs> the, the, building, the buildings looked like they were going all the way up to heaven, you know? And the right. taxi yeah. cabs and the peop, people walking here and there and all over the place, and the, and the board with the lights and all the, it was like so fantastical to me, you know? It was like six years old. And then she takes me into Radio City Music Hall. Oh my! And she and she, yeah and and she I get this this I got to tell you this is very very interesting. Uh, and we sat down, and I couldn't take my eyes off that stage. I mean that was like the beginning for me when I saw the Rockettes come out. I said, "Whoa, ah yeah. oh, my word!" You know that's the first time. I realized I liked women, you know, <laughs> six <laughs> years old. Right. <laughs> so, so I, after that show, I mean, I think it had a, I think it had an effect on me that lasted. I mean, we don't know about me getting into show business because when I saw that stage, wow. it was, it was like, it was like magical, you know? So, yeah, it's like you belonged anyway. there, even though you didn't know that you belonged there yet. Yeah, yeah. well, I can go on and on with my early early stuff, but uh, uh, I don't know if you want to go into something else or what, you know. So how did how did it, did things move forward where you ended up getting into more of show business things professionally? Like obviously okay. you were born into the right family and into DNA and like it and then when you I can imagine you as a little boy seeing that stage and it's I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. Like that's just where you belong. So how did you transition from all of that into Well it started your with, profession? It started it started that I became a very good trombone player. 
Oh, and okay. I got it when I was in high and I was in high school. Uh, we had Mr. Greenfield. He was a tremendous music teacher. I, I mean, I got better musical training in high school, which was not a musical school, than I did when I went to college. I was a music major. I'll tell you about that later. But uh, 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 and and so he had a he formed he had it for going for many years. He had a a big band called the he named it the Blue Jackets. And I played trombone in the big band. Yeah. And every semester, we would put on concerts for the student body. And we were like we were like stars in high school. You know, Kirk would come over and we'd play the, play the theme song. Like, and I don't know if you remember that big band era. With, you know, first of all, I, I was, my father introduced me to that era because I was born in 1938, don't forget. So I go way back, and uh, my father, used to, my father's best friend, who was also his younger brother, Tommy, uh, was the uh, bad boy, uh, no, the road manager for a famous band in the 1930s called Glen Gray Casaloma Band. I don't know, I don't know if anybody would remember that that name, but anyway, and my father used to play all the old records of Tommy Dorsey and Jimmy Dorsey and, and Glenn Miller and all the so they were they were the rock stars of that day, you know? And I'm sure uh, were my parents so, played my parents played their music all the time. I loved them. I love big band. I love it. Oh yeah, yeah. And they were terrific. I mean they were and and of course now when the war came in nineteen forty one when we, when the when the when we got bombed in Pearl Harbor, Uncle Tommy, by the way, I have a picture with him when I was three years old. He was going to go away. He, he, he quit uh, the Casaloma band and joined the, the Coast Guard. And, uh, and he came to say goodbye. He's going overseas, and I have a picture of him in his sailor suit. And I'm barely off the floor. So anyway, and uh, he left, and uh, so getting back. By the way, uh, it ended tra very tragically. Uncle Tommy got killed in the war. Mm. Uh, my father ne never got over that. You know, it was a horrible thing. It was horrible because that was his best friend as well as his brother. You know. Right. So. Mm. So, but but so now playing in the Blue Jackets, and. Uh, uh, at the big band, you know, and now I'm like 15 years old. Like I, so I get a call from my cousin Jamesy. He says a friend of mine owns this nightclub. He wants a band. Do you have a band? So I said no. He said, Did you know any guys you could be? Yeah. So I got put a few guys and we went and we and I played this nightclub. I'm 15 years old. <laughs> and you just put together a bunch of guys and did it. Yeah, yeah, and and, and oh, I was singing I and playing, singing and playing the trombone, and that was the beginning when I really, really like I say this is what I got to do, you know. So singing every night, and there's, as time goes by now, uh, I I I get it, I get it, I get in with some real good musicians, you know. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was with a, I, I got with a band called the Vanguards, and uh, and we were a big hit in New Jersey. We had a big following, you know. And then I, 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 Frank Vincent, who a lot of people know as from the Sopranos and from Goodfellas and all the Scorsese movies, great actor, but he was a great drummer. He had a band called the Aristocats. And, I remember that band. Yeah, and I used to mm -hmm. sit in with them. And one, any time one of the band members would take off, he would call me and fill in, and I would sing songs and jump around and fool around, and you know, I was I was finding my way in the show business, you know. So and I I did that, and then I was working with the vanguards, and uh, and then at this time I'm in college. And I'm playing every night, and I'm going to school every day, 
you know. And uh, uh, that was about this time. Oh, I got to tell you this. I forgot this. <laughs> Am I going on too long here? No, you're not going on too long at all. Where'd you go to college? I went to Montclair. It's a university now. At the time, it was Montclair State Teachers College. And I was a music major, a trombone major, and a piano minor. Ooh. Now, to graduate, I had a requirement to conduct the concert band, not the, not the uh, orchestra, concert band, which means there were no strings. Right. And you had to, you had to do a full concert with an audience and the thing. Diane, I got to tell you the story. <laughs> yes, I want to hear so, it. So, so I I pick a I pick a piece. By a, uh, by a, an author that I liked, it was called Vincent Persichetti. It was called Psalm for Band. Okay, mm-hmm. now the whole the orchestra, the whole audience was full, and I prepared and we rehearsed and everything. You know, this was like a formal night. You got to get the picture. It's a formal night. A concert, right. you know, and everybody's right. in the in the audience. Every my whole family was sitting in the front row, and I and also my nephew, now who's sixty five years old, a very successful lawyer in New Jersey. At the time, he was five years old, and and we were very close. In fact, when he was born. My brother had him so young. Me and my sisters thought he was ours. We were that's how close we were. I always thought he was my kid. So they're sitting in the front row. So now it's very quiet. I'm backstage and I'm 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 shivering. I'm oh my god, how am I going to do this? <laughs> I mean to conduct a, a full concert, you know, and, and with something you never did before. So. I peek out and I see everybody. I go, oh my God, how am I gonna do that? So, comes the time, right? Mm-hmm. So I come out, I walk out, and there's always like polite applause. The conductor comes out, you know, polite right applause. Right. So I come down, I take that that short little bow, real real nice. So I turn around to the band. I got my baton in my hand. And I tap it on the on the uh, uh, the music stand, which means okay. instruments up, ready to go, right? So right. now I start conducting. Now Diane, there's four movements, right? In a in a in a, right. in a symphony. Mm-hmm. So the first movement is kind of I forgot the name. They had names, proper names, you know. And I'm going through, and everything's going fine. Second movement, the by the time I got to the fourth movement, the music got really wild. It was a wild kind of a uh, 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 kind of a beat, you know. And it, it, it's going crazy. And I'm waving my arms like a maniac, you know. I'm waving my <laughs> arms like a maniac, and I'm waving and I'm going crazy. The music's going. I'm waving. But all of a sudden, I come down and I accidentally hit my baton on the music stand and it broke in half and it flew up to the ceiling and it came down and I swear to God it went right into the tube of the tuba into the <laughs> hole of the tuba and Diane the place went nuts the, it was hurrah the, 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 the band stopped playing they, they, were, they were coughing up, they were spitting up they were laughing the audience was in hysterics <laughs> And I'm standing there like a jerk. I didn't know what to do. I was standing there like a real fool. I said, oh, my God, what, how, did I, how did I do this? Now, listen to this. My little nephew, Bernie, is, he was named after my brother, five years old. Well, he stood up from the front row. He stood in his seat, and he yelled back to the audience, don't make fun of my uncle. Don't make fun of my uncle. Oh. It was hysterical. They loved him. It was hysterical. 
and th- things calmed down, and I finished the the concert. But that's 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 one of the classic stories, you know. So, oh wow! Uh, yeah. So anyway, so now. Uh, you want me to go on with more things like this? Yeah, so I, how did how did you get into film and theater and television? Okay, I'll, 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 I mean, did it get I'll, added okay, to the music or or did it segue no, I, from I, music I, I, not, I, How did that I, work? I, it, was, it, it, was not, it was not something that I ever thought about, and I'll tell you how I did it. I got a job. Now, I'm 25 years old at this time. I was singing uh-huh. since 15, almost every night. And I was using my voice very incorrectly, you know. I was right. I was laying on the on the vocal. I was I was ah, 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 and I was like that, more like uh, mm-hmm. Michael V. Gazzo, you know. Right. Okay. Uh, so um, what happened was I got a job at the Five Hundred Club in Atlantic City. Now, I don't know if anybody re- knows of the history of the 500 Club. 500 Club is, was like the Copacabana of Atlantic City. This was way before they had gambling in Atlantic City. This was one of the greatest nightclubs in the world. This is where uh, Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin hooked up in 1946. In 1946, they hooked up there. And Frank Sinatra and all the biggest stars in the world all worked there because Frank Sinatra was great friends with with a well-known uh, nefarious guy called Skinny D'Amato who owned the place. Now, of course, they had the big room, and I was working in the lounge. Now, I'm working every night, and I'm singing. All of a sudden, something with my voice went south, I, and it was hurting me. I couldn't sing. I could hardly sing, and I was, and I was mm. depressed. I said, "What? Well, I was. I I, I got to work. How am I? How am I going to work? I can't sing." And I, and the, and one of the girls. There was a, a Broadway show in, in the big room at the time, and they used to come out and watch our show in the lounge, you know. And uh, she says, "You know something?" She said, "After the summer, why don't you come with me, to New York?" And I'll introduce you to my vocal coach, and maybe she can help you get your voice back. But by this time, Diane, I was just, oh I wow, could hardly talk. Yeah. oh yeah, I was. Uh, it was it was very depressing. I I was thinking I'll never work again. I was very right. very 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 depressed, you know. So I went to right. see her, and it was Vera Brenner, and she happened to be you uh, Brenner's uh, sister. And uh, she was the, one, the w- most wonderful, warmest uh, person and and had the most influence in my life. She was a great woman. Well, she took to me and she worked real hard with me. And as depressed as I was, she kept giving me hope, you know, and she uh, she worked. The voice started coming back. It took a while. Vocal exercises. And, and and first of all, she sent me to a doctor, and the doctor said, "Don't, don't even talk for a few months." So I mean, it took a long time, but she wow. worked with me, and she and she gave me hope, you know. And now, this is something I I I'm embarrassed to say because I don't like saying things like this, but because I have to tell you because it's why you asked me a question. Uh, one day she said to me, and she was a tall, statuesque woman she, from Russia, you know. Mm-hmm. And one day she said to me, she says, Anthony. <laughs> I say, yeah. She says, do you know how talented you are? I said, no, I don't know. She says, you, are, you have a very, very special talent. I said, I do. I didn't realize, what, you know, I said, what is she saying to me? She says, in fact, I believe you have star quality. Oh. And I think right. that you, and I think you'd make a marvelous 
actor. And I'm talking, I'm thinking, like, this is crazy. I never thought of <laughs> acting. And this, this is insane. And I, and, and, and I didn't know anybody thought that I was that talented, you know. Or, you right. know. But she, she swore by it. Like I said, I'm a little embarrassed to say all this. But I have to say it. But she, so, 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 and, and I was, I was really thrown by it. And, but, and, and I was, I, I was humbled, you know. And right. she sent me to this, she sent me to this very famous acting school in New York called uh, Herbert Berghoff Studios, where a lot of wonderful, wonderful, well-known, like Al Pacino, a lot of people studied there, you know. Mm-hmm. And I studied with this uh, teacher, well-renowned teacher called Bill Hickey, you know. And, uh, and Bill Hickey took to me right away and he, uh, he, he introduced me. I did, I did some steam. He had me do a Shakespeare thing and I'm thinking my, and he, he assigned me. I said, I can't do Shakespeare. What are you kidding? I come from the street of uh, the neighborhood. I can't do Shakespeare. Right. He says, try it. <laughs> so, so he right. says, just try it. It was a monologue. If I remember it from two, two, what is it? Two somebody from Verona? What a, two, two something? Can't remember the name of it. It was a monologue about the guy berating his dog for not behaving. And I got such laughs in the class that people were falling over laughing when I did it. <laughs> right. So 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 Bill went Bill went nuts. He says, "You, I remember his exact words." He says, "Now he's calling me Tony. Tony, you have a nose for comedy." And he went on for twenty minutes telling me how funny I am, you know. And wow, he says, you "Did you really ever do?" Know it. No, I had indications, but you know, I, you know, people, you don't think of. Uh, being funny on stage like that, you know? Right. I mean, right. I, I was, I always, I was always like a, uh, 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 what, what would you call a kibitzer, you know? Right. Yep. So, so, but, but, so, and he, and he said to me, here's where, here's where this started now. He uh-huh. says, did you ever do stand up comedy? I said, no. He says, you got to do it. You got to try it. And I'm thinking, this is nuts. I uh, hear I'm, I'm, I'm now I'm an actor. All of a sudden, I'm a stand-up comedian. <laughs> you know, I right? Like, really, yep. And and all these things are happening to me. I never thought about it. You know. Right. So he says, put together, put together some material, and come in next week and and do some stand-up for the class. So I said, oh my God, I can't. I'm not going to do this. I don't know anything about this. So so I go on. Oh and I remember some old jokes in some of these old books, you know, right, and I put right. together and I got huge laughs. I got huge laughs together. And so now, so it's, uh, this is 1964. Yeah. 1964, 65. So I go down to the bitter end in, in the village in the East village in, in uh, New York city. Uh, and that was a happening place at the time, you know. So I got up on the stage on the on the tryout night. What do you what do you call that? The you know audition. Yeah, well, open yeah mic. You know, audition open night. Mic. Open mic. Open mic. Yeah. I got up there. Diane, mm-hmm. I bombed. No. I bombed so bad there was shrapnel everywhere. And uh, I, I wanted to get off that stage and run all the way home to North to my mother's arms. I was so embarrassed. And the guy comes up to me and says, come back here when you know how to do this. He was so rude. and the, So I went to the class. I told Bill, I said, Bill, I told him what happened. He says, you keep doing it. I'm telling you, you're funny. I don't care what he said, you know. Mm-hmm. So I kept trying to put some material and he said, write your own material. I said, how do I don't write? I don't know how to write jokes. I never, this, <laughs> you see, see, the thing about the stand-up comedy part of my career is that's not something that comes natural to me. It's something that I had to develop 
you know, uh, mm-hmm. and it was a painful, very, very painful experience. And Bill kept telling me how great I am, how great I am, how wonderful I am. I'm a good actor. You're a wonderful comedian, and you're going to do good. So I don't. I kept write, trying to write jokes, and I kept bombing no matter where I went because I, I didn't have material. I didn't have material. So, so going back, you know, I had I had met my wife three years earlier. My, you know, uh, and right. uh, uh, oh, I got to tell you this. I was I was working with going back now. Okay, can I regress? Uh huh. Sure. So I go back. I'm working with my the Vanguards. Remember the band I told you? Yeah. I was working with the Vanguards, a very, very good band, show band. At the time, there was a there was a period of time in show business where Louis Prima was prevalent in around the country, and that was considered what they call a show band, where everybody sang, everybody told jokes, everybody played instruments. We did choreography. And we were a great band of vanguards. So I'm working in this place, hot place in uh, Lynnhurst, New Jersey, called uh, the Garden House. Okay? Mm -hmm. So every night, this beautiful, dark hair, beautiful eyes, long black hair, beautiful body, she's waiting for me by this by the stage when we come off and she always requests songs every show she was there and I never thought any bit, anything about it because as with a woman I was a total failure by this time in my life I was very insecure very shy you know but at night after night she's there looking at me you know and requesting songs and I was so stupid because I didn't realize she, maybe she was flirting with me <laughs> you just uh, missed that totally, right? <laughs> I am no, I'm, I'm, I'm I was dumb. I, I couldn't believe it. And I'm talking, and then I start talking to myself. I said, "She flirting with me? I can't be." I mean, because <laughs> women never talk to me, you know. I mean, she's beautiful, you know. I said, "I can't, I can't." Uh, and I'm thinking to myself, I said, "Should I ask her out?" She said, "Nah, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, don't do that." <laughs> Right, I tell you, but I think to myself, maybe she likes you. Nah, she don't like you. She just wants the song. So I'm thinking, to myself, man, let me give it a shot. So I went up to her, and I said, would you like to go out with me? And she said, yes, just like that. Now, I'm expecting her to say no. So I right. thought I heard no, and I walked away. <laughs> So her yes didn't register right away. This is crazy. Yes. And then I then I go back. I oh, she, she said yes. So I went right back. Hi, I said. I said hi. I'm Tony. She said hi. I'm Rosemary. She says and I love the way you sing. And Aww. so we went out. And we went out. We went to never forget. We went to Odd Spot, a restaurant that became our favorite place, uh, right near her house on Route 17. In, in, in uh, I forgot what town it is. Anyway, so our first date, we talked, we laughed, we laughed. I was like, what a wonderful woman she is, you know? Warm-hearted and beautiful and and uh, just kind and gentle and beautiful, long blonde hair, black hair, and black eyes, you know? She was Sicilian, half Sicilian, you know? And mm-hmm. she had this beautiful, beautiful body. And I said, whoa, she's one sexy broad, I'm telling you, you know. <laughs> so, so we started dating, and then we were together a lot. And, you know, I took her to the Metropolitan Opera. I took her to the Copacabana in New York. I was trying to impress her every time, you know. And uh, right. we, we, we went a lot of, a lot of places. A lot of, in fact, when I was working in the 500 Club uh, in Atlantic City, which I just mentioned, she used to come down on weekends with her mother. And uh, and anyway, 
it didn't take long. You know, the, the as they say, the lightning bolt hit, you know, and we right, fell right. in love. And we fell in love. And so, uh, uh, a wonderful, wonderful woman. So now, if, so, if something brings me back, to, I, I I interrupted myself. I thought was my train of thought. I left. Why did I have to mention her? I don't remember. Anyway, ask me another question, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's very interesting how you um, have all these natural talents, and other people kept pointing out to you. Then you run into the stand-up comedy, and that was a lot harder. And um, so no, where, does okay. theater and, where does theater and television, like how, because you have like such an okay. amazing, vast um, resume okay. experience okay. and things like that. So how do all okay. these branches all right. happen? Okay. That's, I'm okay. curious about how that worked. Okay, now we come to a point where we're going to get married. And I said to Rosemary, I said, Rose, I said, what do you think? We get married and we go out to California because there's a lot of opportunity out there. Well, she didn't bat an eye. She she said, yes. Now, I was afraid. You know why? She's an Italian girl with an Italian family. I thought she said, I can't leave my mother and father, you know, because the whole right, neighborhood, right. the cousins and the whole. But she said, yes, just like that. <gasps> so, so now her father... Now, because that's his daughter, you know, he didn't want her to go, and he was very upset. He, in fact, he got so emotionally upset, and he wasn't sick or anything, but he wound up in the hospital just out of emotional upset. Wow. Because he didn't want to lose his wow. daughter, you know. So he was in the hospital a couple of weeks, so we put her off. We put off the, the trip, but we got already got married, you know. We put off the, the trip to California. And my mother and father didn't want us to go. Uh, stay here, you know. And finally, they all acquiesced. And everybody was okay. Father, once they accepted it, you know. Right. I, I, I had an uncle on my mother's side, Uncle Sam, and he was a terrible guy. He was a low life. You know, I never liked him to begin with. And he cornered me one day. Diane, listen to this. He cornered me. He said, come here, Anthony. So what? So I hear you're going to Hollywood. He's a wise guy. He said, I hear you're going to Hollywood. I said, yeah. He said, why are you going there? I said, I want to maybe get, get into, there's a lot of opportunity. What opportunity? For what? I said, I want to be an actor. An actor? What are you, crazy? Get your head out of the clouds. Come down to earth. You got to be good looking to be an actor. You can't do that. Stay home here. Get a job. You're, you're disappointing your mother and your father. And he's screaming at me in my face. And and, and, and then he left. And, and I tell you, he motivated me more than ever. I said, I'm going. I don't, I don't need this, you know. Right. So... So finally, so we finally drove out to California, mm -hmm. 1967. I, 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 I got a job playing the trombone in the house band at Ciro's. Ciro's mm -hmm. became the comedy store. So okay. Ciro's was a famous nightclub in Hollywood. And I got a job playing the trombone in the house band, the big band that backed up all the stars, you know. Mm -hmm. And right. then, and I got got an apartment. We got a very small little place, and I and after that, I got a piano, piano, uh, 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 piano bar job in the Hollywood Hotel, you know, playing mm -hmm. every night. Yep. And now here's here's what here's what 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 really threw me, Diane. I come to Hollywood, right? Now, I'm trying to get in as an actor, and I'm trying to get in. I'm, 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 and what, here's what, what threw me. The, it caused me such pain, emotional pain, I never understood it. Because of what, what, what Vera said to me, how much that she revered my talent, and what Bill Hickey said to me, 
I'm, I can't get arrested in Hollywood. And I'm thinking, how come with all this talent, nobody else sees it? I couldn't believe it. I thought it was going to wow. be an easy little, you know? Nobody else sees it. But I kept working at it. I did I did all those small theaters, equity waiver theaters. I took more acting lessons. I took I kept going. And I, in the theater, I kept calling casting directors to come down. The years are going by, and I'm thinking, this is crazy. Where I'm not getting anywhere. Because they said, "Why well, do you have a do you have a SAG card? No. Do you have any film on you? No. So the agent won't take you. You know. Oh. So I'm yeah. work, working and working and working, and uh, and uh, and then I got into the comedy store people. You know. And I started, by the way, Rosemary kept giving me her paycheck every week. And she told me, buy jokes, buy material. She, one thing I'm going to tell you about my wife. She backed me the whole way. She never once said to me, get a regular job. Not, not even a, a hint of it. So, so. I I I I can't praise her enough and love her enough for that. So so I'm getting better and better at the stand up. You know, I'm doing better and better. You know, I'm getting more jokes, more better and I'm learning how to do it. Go to the comedy store and I'm starting to do better. And I met Tom Dreesen there. In fact Tom Dreesen was was instrumental in me and in getting me on television. You know, because oh, he wow. recommended me to he recommended me to Merv Griffin. And I got on Merv Griffin's show and a couple of times. And then from there, I went on Dinah Shore. Then I went on uh, John Davidson's show, Madam's Place. What else? Uh, there was other ones. I can't think of them. Norm Crosby's Comedy Shop. And Make Me Laugh. That was a popular show and all that. So now... I, a, 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 a very big manager sees me on Merv Griffin. He called me into his office. His name was Buddy Mora. I got a phone call. He said, Buddy Mora wants to meet you. I said, oh, bye. So Buddy Mora, like me, saw my show, and uh, my stand-up, and, right. and he, he contacted The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Right. And they don't want me. They don't want me. They saw me. They don't like what I do. They don't like what I do. And he kept trying. And then he said to me, he says, you know, if I can't get you on Johnny Carson, I have nowhere else to go. That's your launching place. He said, so I'm, I can't represent you. So I said, mm -hmm. fine. Now, at the time, I got to tell you my worst experience in show business. Want to hear this? Sure. My worst experience. I was I was working at a little club in Beverly Hills called Ye Little Club. It was a very hot nightclub, and I was doing my stand up. One night, I'm not going to mention names here because I don't want to mention names. One night, I did a great show, and after the show, a very well-known personality guy, a man, walks up to me with two beautiful women on his arms. Now, i got to preface this first. To get on The Tonight Show was that you had a whole career. When Johnny Carson came from New York to, to, to California in 1972, I believe it was, Every comic in the world came to California, to Hollywood, to try to get on a Tonight Show. Because if you got on a Tonight Show, that was everything. That was everything right. to a comic because you could get a television series. Everything, everything could happen from there. And it was, and, and that's what we all, we all were working towards very hard. It meant everything. You got to understand that. So he comes up right. to me with these two beautiful women on his arms. And he says to me, well, you got it. 
I said, what do you, what, what do you mean? I got it. He said, tonight show. You got it. He said, they, they sent me to see you. And, uh, you, you're, you're terrific. And, uh, I'm going to get you on with Johnny Carson. You're on the tonight show. He says, call them tomorrow, wow. go over the material and do all, all that. But they sent me to see you. I couldn't sleep. I How could bad. not sleep. I mean, this was like, this was it, my big break. So I called the, the office the next day, and I asked for the the uh, uh, talent coordinator, uh, Craig Tennis. Message me, who, who's calling? Tony Russell. Uh, what's it about? Well, I said, well, uh, what's his name? I'm not going to say his name. Saw me last night, and and uh, and he said, talk to Craig Tennis. So Craig Tennis gets on the phone. I said, hi, Craig. I said, Tony Russell. Uh, what's his name? Called, told me to call you. He saw me last night. He said, put me on with Johnny. So so I'm here. I'm ready. Go over the material so we could go. go. He said, what are you talking about? Oh, my. I said, well, what's his name? Sent me he just, to, to talk to you. To put me. He, you sent you sent him down to see me. He said, we didn't send anybody to see you. I never even heard of you. And he hung up. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. Well, I started to cry. I bet. I started to, I started to cry. And my wife, my, if I, I, I can't curse on your show, but my wife started cursing. <laughs> <laughs> she, she called them all kind of names and everything when I told her what happened. And, and so uh, that, that was devastating. That was the, so now th- let's go on because we don't have a lot of time now because uh, I, the big thing is when I got with Bonnie Hunt. Right. Because I, I, you know, uh, and, and I, I, I'm i even covering, every, we're not going to cover everything in an hour. So uh, am I doing all right? You're doing great. And we can go over a little bit depending on your time. So so then what happened? Okay, so well, how, okay. did, how did you how well, did well, it all playing... finally come together? You've got me on the edge of my seat, Tony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I started first. First, uh, after, after I did the Merv Griffin show, I I got an agent, you know, and I started mm-hmm. doing little commercials and and I started doing little bit parts on television, little small little, you know, walk on wall, little say a line, you know, and I start building up. And then, because uh, I I I got I started getting shows like uh, Mad About You and a Home Improvement and you know all those shows. And I started more and more getting better. I got a better agent, you know, and uh, and it started building up. One day, the, 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 uh, I got a call to audition for a very big casting director, Ellen Chenoweth. And it was a gangster movie. And so every gangster type in Hollywood, there must have been a hundred guys out there in the hallway <laughs> right. coming in and out and coming in and out to audition for the show. So so I went in and I was alone with her and she had me read. She said, Would you read this other part? I said, Yeah, all right. I read the other part. She said, Try this other one. Um, she had me about four or five different parts you know she said would you go outside and uh, when I call you come back in again I said oh okay so I go outside a little later she calls me back in she said try this one again try try this one again she said thank you very much so the next day I got a call that Barry Levinson wants to meet me now Barry Levinson is one of the premier directors in the world you know Right. Oh, yeah. And so I go in, and Ellen Chenoweth is there with him, and he goes through the same thing. Try this part. Try this part. Read this. Hey there. Try this. <laughs> so I didn't even know what it was. All I knew was a gangster movie, you know. So right. I came out of the out of, out of the thing, and the receptionist was stand, sitting there. I said, "What's this movie? What is it?" She said, "It's called Bugsy, starring Warren Beatty." I right. Said, oh my. God, if I had known that, I would have blew it. <laughs> right. I would have blew it for you. 
So sure enough, I got the call, and that was a big, big move for me because after that, I got a lot of parts, a lot of stuff. When I, when I did Bugsy with Warren Beatty, you know? Right. And so... so, oh, did, so time, did you have fun doing that movie? Was it fun? Oh, oh yeah. You know, we we were the first scene in the movie that they shot. It wasn't the first scene in the film itself. Mm-hmm. But they, it was, we spent two 12-hour days on that one scene. And it was great fun. We're working with them. Uh, Warren Beatty was a terrific guy, and uh, and uh, Barry Levinson was terrific. A, a great sense of humor because he was a comic himself, you know. Right. He was a yeah. comic before. And uh, one thing that I I don't know if the people in your audience remember this, uh, but uh, if they remember that scene, Barry Levinson gave us one direction. And he said to us, I don't want the audience to think, to know or feel that this scene is funny or scary. And a lot of people think we captured that, think we captured that, you know. So right. uh, that was that was my, my experience there. And then a few years later, Frank Vincent, my dearest friend, from from the Aristocats, tremendous drummer, but he became a wonderful actor. He became from from uh, from uh, what's the first film? Uh, Mad, Mad uh, uh, oh, the first film that Joe Pesci did with him. Uh, can't think of Mad. Mad. Anyway, uh, from that to Goodfellas to Casino to the Frank Vincent, and he's the one that did "Go Get Your Shine Box." Now people will know yeah. who I mean. Right. So, so Frank Frank calls me. I was in Burbank. He calls me. He's Anthony. Talk like that, Anthony. Come over to Vegas here. I'm gonna introduce you around. And I said okay. So I went over. I didn't have a lot of money. I checked into a cheap hotel, motel, and. Uh, I met him and his wife Kathy. And we went, and we went to see the the, the first thing we did. We went to see the wedding scene in in casino. And right. Joe Pesci. Joe Pesci. I knew him from the neighborhood. You know, we were we were in the same neighborhood. We musicians. You know, and huh. uh, so I hadn't seen him in years. Joe Pesci come over say hello. Alfred Natoli come over say hello. Uh, it was another guy who was in the who was in high school with the, in the band in the Blue Jackets, and we worked together many times. They came and say hello, and some other people I knew. And and so Frank introduced me around to everybody, told everybody I was an actor, and he told, he happened to run into Barbara Dufina, the the producer of the movie, that I was an actor, and, and that's it. Now, I never met Scorsese before you know. So what happens is the next night, the next night, Joe and Frank are doing some night work, and I was hanging around with Frank's wife Kathy. It was two o'clock in the morning, and we were in the in the in the uh, the, the uh, what do you call the trailer, and the uh, right. So we said we said let's get a hot dog. We and we were in a parking lot downtown Las Vegas, two o'clock in the morning. So we got a hot dog, and we're walking across, across the parking lot. All of a sudden, this young kid runs up to me, and he goes, points at me. He goes, you. I said, wow, wow, who, what are you talking about? Come with me right away. What are you talking about? He said, Marty wants to see you right away. He said, come with me. I said, Marty wants to see me. Ooh. So I'm walking with you. I said, what's going on? Why? He says, we're all set up for the next scene. The guy supposed to do the scene is in the hospital, and Marty wants to see you. He wants to talk to you. Now, what happened was, Robert Dufina, the producer, remembered me from Frank telling her that I was an actor. And she asked him, well, what, uh, is he any good? Frank said, yeah, he's in the actor's studio. He's a good actor. You know, by the way, I never said that. I was in, I, uh, during, during my, during my uh, uh, theater days earlier, 
I I I did audition and got into the Actors Studio, one of the mm-hmm. most prestigious places in the world. But anyway, he said, "Yeah, he's an actor studio actor." So, you know, so I go, and I go by the by the set, and Frank is standing there with Joe Pesci, and Frank says to me, "Anthony, don't be nervous." I said, "I ain't nervous, Frank. Now, I'm very very excited. I'm gonna do this." So I go into the into the room, to the parlor with the bedding room, and who's standing there all by himself? Martin Scorsese <laughs> introduces himself. I introduced. I said, Marty, I know who you are. I said, I know. I've been trying to get with you for years, you know. So he, he asked me a few things about myself. I told him I was in the actor's studio, you know, and he told me what happened. Now Joe comes in. He calls Joe in, Joe Pesci, and he he says to us, he says, "Listen, here's the scene. This is what it's about. I want you two guys to go over there and do an improv. And when you feel like you got something that that fits what I want, come back and show it to me." So we go back and we do. Okay, you're taking. I'm giving. People know the scene. You take. You know. I thought you were giving. What if I take your head and put it through the window? Baby. So we come back and we show it to him. And Marty looked at me and he says, he's, I could see him saying, you're very good. I could see it in his eyes, you know? Right, right. So, and so then he, at that point he said, go get a haircut, go get the wardrobe, and let's shoot this thing. I said, Wow. And I did it. Ah, nice. Diane, let me, Diane. I was on cloud nine. I was work. I was surrounded by genius: Joe Pesci, right. Frank Vincent, Robert De Niro, and uh, and uh, and uh, well, uh, what's his name? There, the little guy. I can't think of his name. Martin Scorsese. Uh, uh, I, I couldn't believe that I was in this company. I was I'm, I was humbled. And so we did the scene. I'm in wardrobe getting undressed. The little kid comes up to me again when I'm getting dressed. He says, Marty wants to see you. This was after we did the scene. Right. Again, again, I'm a little embarrassed because I come back and Marty, Marty Scorsese spent about 15 minutes telling me how wonderful an actor that I am. And that meant the world to me. That meant the world to me coming from probably the greatest director ever, you know? Right. So so that was that. Now, the thing is this. Now, financially, still a big struggle in my life because I'm not making any money, you know? You do a job here and there and it's over, you know? And Rosemary had to keep working. So... And I kept saying, right, and I'm, now I'm going back to uh, piano bars trying to make a living. And I kept saying, when is it going to happen? I want to be a big star, you know. Everybody t- right. says I'm supposed to be a big star. I said, well, when is it going to happen? You know? Right, exactly. Uh, yep. So, uh, you know, uh, but then I thought to myself, Marty saw it like Vera saw it and and, uh, uh-huh. and uh, Bill Hickey saw it. Marty saw it. So there's got to be something there. I got to keep going. And I'm going, right. I'm walking, I'm struggling. And a couple of years go by, a couple of years, no money, we're struggling, you know. Then I get a piano bar job in a place called Carmine's. Oh. On uh-huh. Santa, Santa Monica Boulevard yep. in West Los Angeles. Very, very famous place. And it's a high industry there. High right. industry. So, now, you know, I had my uh, my uh, demo tapes, which I had made. I had made a lot of them. I always keep them in the back of my car, you know. Right. And I passed out so many of them. I met directors. I met people there. And there, I made friends. And I gave out my tapes to everybody. And nothing ever came of it, you know. Then one night, Bonnie Hunt comes in with some friends, sits right in front of me. 
I didn't even know who she was. I wasn't sure. Um, and it was a it was a slow night, and they were egging me on, and I was really singing my best and playing my best. Well, she liked it. She's a very nice, and and I still wasn't sure. She came back two nights later with a with a girlfriend, and she sat near, listened to me. She didn't say anything. Very nice, and then she kept coming back. So one night she says to me, would you like to have a drink with me at the table? I said, I'd love to. So I go to have her, and I I find out her name. Now I knew her name, but I wasn't sure of the face, you know. Bonnie Hunt. Right. Said, Ooh, this is big time here, you know. So, um, so, and then in the conversation, it came out that I was an actor. She had no idea. She said, really? I had no idea. You know, I said, yeah, I got a demo in the car. You know, if you want it. She said, yeah, let me see it. So I went out to the car. I bring my, my demo tape. I gave it to her. She came back in a few nights later, and she handed it back to me. She said, I really love this. Thank you. And now she kept inviting me to her cable every time she came. And we became friendly, very friendly, very friendly. You know, we came like for good friends, you know. So now right. what happened was, this was in the year 2000, I believe. Christmas time. She calls me. She says, Tony, would you like to play the piano for my Christmas party? I said, I'd love to. And I didn't ask her for any money. I didn't say nothing, you know. Uh, I, I didn't want to say how much you're going to pay. I didn't want to say that to her. But she paid me a lot of money for that night. I had never expected it. And a lot of stars were there, a lot of people. She's got this. She's got this house where... The piano is in a special room by itself where everybody gathered around, you know, and drinking a little bit and around the piano. And right. so and so now now the, it comes 2000 year one, okay? Now there's a starting a buzz, a lot of buzz around that Bonnie's getting her own show, her own sitcom, okay? A lot right. of buzz, and I'm listening, I'm hearing them, mm, you know, so... Uh, the year goes by, finally, we hear, she got the show. She got a big, big break in ABC, prime time, uh, 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 eight o'clock, prime time ABC, major network. Wow. So, the years go by, she calls me again, she wants to play at my birthday, at my Christmas party again? I said, I'd love to. So I'm playing all night, and all the celebrities are there congratulating her on her part, getting her a show and everything, you know. So at the end of the night, the people had by, they were getting late, and they had left the piano room, and they went to another part of the room uh, of the house, and they were gathering over there. Bonnie happened to walk by and see me playing all by myself. So she's, Tony, what are you doing? I said, I'm playing. She said, you don't have to play anymore. She said, nobody's here. She said, come with me and have a drink with me. I said, okay. So I get up from the piano. Now, I'm following her to the other place, part of the house. As I'm following her, she casually turns her head around to me and says, by the way, Tony, you're in my show. And I went, I'm a a, 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 a real part. I mean, I got lines. I got lines. I got a part. Yes, Tony. I said, I'm real part? It's a real part? Yes. Come here, and I'll tell you about it. So we have a drink, and she's telling me over this part that, and people know if they remember the show. It was a show within the show. It was a small talk show in the morning, a morning Chicago talk show. And I was to be her her Ed McMahon, so to speak, uh, right. on the piano and talking back and forth with her. And to get the bits and talk them and and they get anyway. She told me the whole thing, and and I, Diane, I didn't sleep for three days. I didn't sleep oh, for three days. Right? I mean, that now is listen, so cool. Now, now, but listen now. Now the next day, after about a week, she calls me, Tony. Yes, Bonnie. The network don't want you. Ah, what do you mean? Why? 
said, well, they don't know you. They think you're a little too old, you know. And they, oh, no. She said, but I'll tell you what. She says, I got, they said if you would audition for them, they may reconsider. I said, I'll audition whatever you want to do. So she set up the audition for me. And the audition's going to be the next day. Bonnie calls me, Tony. Yes, Bonnie. You don't have to audition. I got you the job. Ah. Uh, oh, my God. And she says, she says to me, call your agent, have them contact business affairs, and make your deal. So I, get, I do that. And I told my wife, my wife is already like, she's getting, she, are they going to, are, are they going to pull it back now or again or, you know? So, so I, my, my agent calls me a few hours later and she tells me the deal. Diane, I never heard so much money in my life. I told my wife, my wife said, what? Wow. Said, well, how much? And I told her how much. She said, say it again. I said, what? Well, say it again. I said, she started, we started whooping and dancing and singing. And it was so much money, I couldn't believe it. You know? So we did the show. And we were on I two years. I, I got national recognition, international recognition. And uh, and uh, we, we bought the house. First time we ever bought anything. Bought my house and my car, all cash, everything, you know, and uh, like that. Now come to the uh, to the record. The the hardest part of the story, Diane. Right. I talking to my friends Charlie Pignon. Charlie Pignon is my dear friend, who's the president of Sinatra Enterprises, and. He always liked the way I sang and performed. And, and we were talking about making an album together, you know. But he couldn't right. put his name on it because he's associated with Sinatra. But my dear friend and the, my closest, dearest friend in the world, Billy Paul, played drums with me for years. And he produced the album. Well, we got, we got Tom Rainier who after he did my album went with Tony Bennett and Chuck Berghoffer on bass. Tom Rainier played piano, by the way. And Chuck Chuck Berghoffer played the bass with Sinatra for years. And we had this trio. And we went and did this album. And Rosemary was going to be the executive producer. And so we went to the studio. And we did, an, uh, we did most of it. And we didn't finish it. Then Rosemary was uh, she was uh, not feeling good. To, she wasn't eating too good, and I didn't, we didn't think anything about it. She would eat, take a couple of bites. I nicknamed her Two Bites. I called her Two Bites. Mm. The, then she got sick with uh, lung cancer, and. She didn't make it. No. So I wasn't thinking about music or anything. I mourned her for a long time. I wasn't thinking about show business. I was only missing her, you know. And I cried and cried and cried. And Billy was my most very, very supportive. Billy helped me get get through it you know he helped me he was yeah. he was right there for me and so i don't know how much years later a year later i think it was or something we're having lunch again with charlie and billy and they charlie said why don't we finish the album and we're dedicated to rosemary i yeah. said that's terrific that's terrific that's a great idea and and that's the album. It's called uh, I Remember You, The One and Only Love of My Life. And if they, by the way, if anybody wants to buy the album, it's on, they can get it on uh, 
uh, the, all the all the services, the iTunes and all them services. Or you know, if they want right. interested in hearing well, my album. And we'll make sure to put links to how to buy the album in the show notes so everybody can just click on there and grab it for me. Get it. Yeah. It's a great album. So thank you so much. I think people would like it, you know. I think it's a it's a universally like the I I I've I've gotten a lot of response. Of course it's playing all the time on Seriously Sinatra on the cable, you know, the uh, what do you call it, whatever you call that. It's playing all the time on there. And I, I get a lot, a lot of response from it. So uh, anyway, so I don't know what else to tell you, Diana. Hey, and, well, and, and, and pardon me, what, what, I think I told you a little bit yesterday. After I mourned Rosemary, I decided I can't do this. I have to live my life, you know. And I decided it was a choice. I'm going to be happy because that's what she would want me to be. And I'm going to I'm going to stay happy as I could. So I live alone right. now. I've a, I've adjusted to it, and I'm I'm still. Billy and Charlie are still my dearest friends, and my nephew Bernie, my brother Bernie, my sisters Carol and Joyce. I'm surrounded by positivity, so I'm in a good place, and I'm financially secure. I'm 82 years old, and if I work again, that'll be fine. If I don't, that's also fine. I'm, I'm just trying to enjoy my 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 relationships and my time uh, that I have left. That's it. So I don't know what else to tell yeah. you. Well, I, ha- I only have one question, um, and I want to remind everybody you've been listening to Tony Russell talk about the, his amazing adventures in his career. So I'll make sure that his bio and – Links are in the show notes so you can um, learn more about him and be inspired, especially by this album. This music is amazing. But I have one last question for you, Tony. Okay, you ready? It's a trick question. Sure. If, you know, with all the adventures you've had in life, and all the ups and the downs and everything, I'm wondering if, if we had, a, if we were going to create like a billboard for a roadside that would have your message on it a message from Tony to the world that everyone would see. What message would you put on that billboard? God is always right. Ooh, that's a good one. God is always right. I love it. Oh, my gosh, I have goosebumps. I have goosebumps. That was great. Well, I have had the best time talking to you and listening to your stories and and how things unfolded. And I love how the beginning and when people could see it in you and – how you noticed it, that they saw it in you, and you kept going. Your perseverance and knowing that I'm just going to keep doing I'm going to keep doing it. And Rosemary's support for you, it's just, it's so beautiful. I have goosebumps. It's it's just such a beautiful story, and I so appreciate you taking time to to hang out with me here and share it all because it's so By the way, one more thing, Diane. Thank you so much. By the way, I was 63 years old when I got Bonnie Hunt's show. It took me that long. Three years old. Yeah. So a lifetime yeah. coming out of the womb singing yeah. and all of the work and all of the diligence and perseverance. If the break happened when you were 63 years old. Yeah. That that yeah. speaks volumes about your, your character My, and who Billy, you are. Billy, and gift. Billy, Billy, Billy always says that it's one in a million that that could happen to anybody. What happened to me at 63 years yeah. old. Yep. You know? Yeah. It's amazing. It's really amazing. You I know, think I, I, I'm looking at I'm looking at my watch. I don't realize we went out an hour and 20 minutes. Is that okay? Yes, it's totally fine. So I want to thank you for being on the show and thank you for everything. It's just been amazing. I'm, I'm just so thrilled well, to I'm, get I'm, to know I'm, you. And, and Diane, I want to say to you too, and, and to Paul, who introduced me to you, uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. I've never done a podcast. At first, I was a little skeptical, you know, but I thought, right. why not? And you've been so kind and generous, and uh, and uh, you're you're a wonderful lady, obviously. So I'm glad well, to be your you. friend. And uh, I don't know what else to say. I I I really appreciate you giving me this opportunity. 
Oh, it's, it's my pleasure, and I can't wait for everybody to hear your stories. I can't wait to listen to them again. Everything you shared was just magical and beautiful, and I couldn't have asked for the show to be any better than it was. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening. I trust you gained some valuable inspiration and information. Please join me and other visionaries in the Someone Gets Me Facebook group. Or for more information on my services and additional episodes, visit someonegetsme.com. Again, thanks for listening.